Serial killers are not crazy people. Less than 2% of them are actually mentally ill. They're very normal. They mow the lawn, they buy groceries, they take their children to school. It could be your neighbor, it could be your husband, your father, or your son. When the dawn of liberation breaks free, people should expect a new lease of life. Maybe the ancient mariner circumnavigating the southern coast of Africa understood the violent mood swings of the Cape of Storms. As she drinks her belly to the brim with splintered wrecks, gulping down tortured souls into monstrous graves. But the monsters of this abyss do not compare to the soul torturers of the shores. followed free. We were the first that ever burst into that silent sea. The Ancient Mariner is a poem about an old sea dog who tells his story to a wedding guest. He makes the wedding guest sit on a rock and then he begins. They were sailing unknown waters and at first the sea was calm and he was bright-eyed about the future and the journey. And then he shot the albatross and death came following and the deck of the ship was littered by the bodies of the dead sailors and he had to look in their eyes day after day after day. And in the end, the only catharsis that he could find was by retelling his story. I chose the poem because there's an analogy between the old mariner and myself. When I became a profiler, I had no idea of the stormy waters that would follow. I had no idea of the death and the destruction that I had to face. And in the end, I can only find catharsis by retelling my story. On my very first day in the South African Police Service, I was flown down to the Cape to start working on the Station Strangler case. The Station Strangler serial killings occurred in the Mitchell's Plain residential area, situated near the Falls Bay coast, where 20 young boys were gruesomely murdered and sodomized. We recently discovered another body of a young boy that was also sodomized and murdered and we suspect it's actually the same accused which committed this gruesome killing. Serial homicide, um, according to my theory, originates in the first six years of the child's development. Um, I looked at the theory of Freud which describes the, develop the psychosexual developmental phases and what I could um, eventually relate to is on the crime scene, for instance, if the breasts of a victim has been mutilated, then I could make the accurate deduction from that that the serial killer was not breastfed. He cuts the breast to get to the milk. Um, and so you can find characteristics of the, of the oral phase, the anal phase, the oedipus phase, etc. on your crime scene and know where the original fixation took place. Now, I'm not saying everybody that wasn't breastfed you know, would become a serial killer. Um, I think the important part is as well in the latency phase when children should identify with a father and start developing a conscience and that does not happen to serial killers. Are they crazy? Um, I don't believe so from the ones that I've interviewed and tested. And also, all these serial murderers in South Africa that have been brought to trial were sent for 30-day observation. And during that 30-day mental observation, they get assessed to see if they're mentally ill. And we have only ever had one out of the numerous serial murderers that we've taken to trial who was found not fit to stand trial because of mental illness. Of the people that I've interviewed um, and my colleagues, they've had various varying types of backgrounds. Some were abused, some didn't, weren't abused. Some grew up in very poor circumstances, some grew up in, in very normal privileged circumstances. So we don't have a good explanation. It's, it's probably a combination of, of various things. Uh, I don't doubt that the person's upbringing has an impact in the same way that all of our upbringing affects the way that we're going to be in terms of our personality and interact with people. Um, there have been, has been research overseas looking at the neurological side, but they found no real differences among serial murderers' neurology uh, compared to a normal murderer. 
I've always had the theory if you have two boys, two brothers growing up in the same family in very adverse circumstances, they could both be sexually molested uh, you know, by, by a father figure. One of them becomes a serial killer and the other one doesn't. Now to me, the only theory that can explain why the one becomes a serial killer and the other one doesn't is the Freudian theory. The phases in the, in the psychosexual development is first of all the oral phase, which is between the ages of naught to two years. The uh, erotogenic zone is the mouth, and this is the, the breast suckling stage. Um, you also get the oral sadistic phase when the baby would be biting. Okay, that you can find on a crime scene if you have bite marks, etc. During the oral phase, the infant can fixate by either not getting enough milk or getting too much. If he feels that he is not getting sufficient milk, he might develop into an adult who is forever searching to have his needs met and who is oversensitive to rejection. With too much milk, he will always expect the world to attend to his needs instantly. Your next phase would be between two to four years. That would be your anal phase. Here the child is a little bit more independent, it learns to walk, it wants to do everything itself. It's also the, called the controlling phase. Fixation during the anal phase occurs if children are forced to use the potty before they are physically ready to, or a toddler can be obsessed with the immense feeling of power over the lingering parents. By then, sexual and aggressive fantasies in the subconscious become more defined since the toddler is learning to speak and interpret symbolism. From four to six years, you would get the Oedipus phase. This is a very important phase. It's a very sexual phase. Erotogenic would be the, uh, the penis for both boys and little girls. This is the phase where children would, um, you know, going to show me yours and I'll show you mine, etc. It's the phase where the little boy would fall in love with the mother and hate the father as the opposition, and the little girl falls in love with the father and hates the mother. A fixation can occur in the Oedipus phase where a boy beats his father in the battle for his mother's affection, or when he sees himself mentally castrated by his parents. The father may castrate him for coveting his wife, and the mother may do the same by rejecting his adoration. At the end of this phase, about from six years on, you know, the puberty phase, that's what we call the latency phase. That is not a sexual phase. Um, the child's energy is now directed into learning. Children go to school, they learn to socialize, they learn to develop empathy for other people, they incorporate moral and ethic codes. And most important here is, is through an identification with a father figure, they develop a conscience. Fixation in the latency phase results in the boy's failure to socialize and empathize, and his primitive sexual and aggressive fantasies are not repressed. He fails to develop a conscience, or when the conscience overdevelops, he grows into a guilt-ridden adult. All serial killers fixate during the latency phase and will also fixate in one or more of the psychosexual phases. Children are sexually orientated during the first three phases. Masturbation and accompanying sexual and aggressive fantasies are repressed during the latency phase, but re-emerge as censored more subliminal versions during the teenage or genital phase. In the case of fixation, these fantasies emerge as irrational symptoms. A fixation would be a psychological short circuit, you know, sort of a bzzz, where light bulbs pop, etc., and, and something goes wrong in the psychological dy dynamics of a person. I'm not sure exactly what causes it, but it might be too much or too little um, of, of a certain stimuli being frustrated or being over-gratified. Things are heating up as police launched a massive manhunt for the station strangler in the Mitchells Plain area today. He will be stopped and everything possible is being done to ensure the safety of all children in the community. Charmu Listus, who was apprehended previously, was thoroughly questioned to establish the modus operandi that have in fact used to approach the victims in these crimes. Reino van Roy and his cousin Elro van Royen were lured to a station by a stranger. Reino became flustered and fled. Elroy followed to the end of the line. I was 14 years old. I was in the first place of school. I came to the strand to a wine. I came to the man and 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 I came to the
kan uusi voor mij helpen. Hij heeft niks basis gepraat, hij heeft niet typisch een boekje op het jaar. En hij heeft geloop, stasis aan de kant toe. En voor hij pad kan oorsteken, heeft hij het typisch een boekje neer gegooid en teruggehaald. En hij heeft mijn neef het oor gegaan. De man en mijn neef het tot typisch stasis gekomen en de trein is aangekomen. Ik heb gewoon kijken of mijn neefje samen in de trein is en hij is samen met man aan de trein. Elroy van Royen was to be the station strangler's last victim and Reino turned out to be his first mistake. The moment I saw the body, I immediately knew it was the station strangler's victim. Some of the detectives weren't sure if, if it was the body of a little boy or a little girl. But I knew, I instinctively knew, that for the first time I'd come face to face with the work of the station strangler. From Reyna's description of the stranger, an identity was compiled. The vigilant community joined in the manhunt, only to discover the mutilated body of a slain Elroy. The two witnesses in this particular case, Fosia Hercules, and Rhino van Rey gave us a good description of the accused. A identity kit was compiled, which assisted us with the arrest of the accused. The identity kit embodies a paper image of a phantasm. It's the beast within that still afflicts the souls of people, such as Elroy's grandmother. Mens voor my baie swak, jy voel al of jy verswak raak. Want jy kan nog nie daar oor dink jy of recht kom na oor jy. Dat jou gedachte gaan oor hoe die kind jy na jy haap gevra nie. Maar nou verwerk jy dit ook, jy wil nie daar aan dink jy. Want het maak jou so seer dat jy daar oor dink, dan raak het jou die eerste. Jy dink nog al die pad, dat jy een gat huis toe kom. Jy weet, ons hele leven het hy sommer net op site gemaakt. Ek weet nie, hoe kan ek sê nie, maar ons voel nie, dit was nodig dat hy, dit moet aan ons gedoen het hy. Dit is verkeerd. Die arme ouwers het hulle kinders lief gehad. Amal het hulle kinders lief gehad. Net so wel sy maag vir hom lief gehad. Not even time can heal the soul that mourns the loss of a child, and it will not fathom the rage that ferments inside the abyss of a tormented soul. In this surreal tale, the strangler becomes flesh, the flesh of a schoolteacher of boys the same age as his victims. In a time when a terrorized community stipulated that their children should be sheltered inside their classrooms and guarded during school breaks, only one teacher declined. He paced the hallways with glee, knocked on the doors of classrooms, and perversely exclaimed, open up, it's the station strangler the morbid joke of the placid and kind teacher, Norman Simons. Norman Simons was one of the uh, very, very organized serial killers. His crime scenes were extremely neat, um, very per perfectionistic, and I think that also um, displayed the, the anal fixation, which is a phase of, of um, control and, and neatness. I think the biggest fear about serial murder is that you, you, you cannot really identify them. They don't look as one expects them to look. Hy het soos een netjes een man voorkom. Hy kom voor soos een ondendelike man. Krent en achter mekaar. Maar weet jy wat is in sy binne lichaam nie. In sy binne ga hy dan gaan nie. Maar sy voorkom lyk goed. Norman Simons is a extremely interesting and intelligent person. He has a split personality. And I have explained that during his younger school days he was sort of mised by his brother Boise and the evil spirit then went into him as a person. He's broad-minded, polite and can communicate easily with any other person. He actually did to the children what was done to him. 
he told us that he had been sodomized by his older brother when he was the same ages as the victims. Now, Simon selected victims um, the same age as him, but also school children, not street children. They, in truth, represented himself. Um, what he actually did was he was committing suicide every time he killed a child. He identified with the aggressor, with his older brother, and the children became him. So there's a role reversal, the passive active role reversal. Now, if he is doing the killing, it means he is actively taking that role and not passively experiencing the pain. There's a photograph of a very neatly dressed Norman Simons in the docket. This photograph was taken one morning by the police because Simons wanted to enroll as a police reservist to assist the station strangler investigating team. Later that day, he killed the last victim, Alroy van Roy. It's not uncommon of serial killers to try and insert themselves into the police investigations. The best part to start drawing up a profile is obviously on the crime scene itself. Um, I usually use the analogy, if you want to know more about an artist, go, go and look at his artwork. Uh, we do try to go to the crime scenes, but because we work nationally throughout South Africa, it's not always practically possible. So in those instances, we would work from crime scene photographs, videos of the crime scene and crime scene descriptions. If your crime scene is very neat, then you know the serial killer is very neat. People are creatures of habit. Secondly, we would then look at victimology. Who are the people who this person is targeting? Are there similarities? Are there differences? What does that tell us? The serial killers kill um, and leave bodies where they feel safe, where they know they would be undisturbed, um, nobody's going to hear them, etc. So why would a person feel safe in this environment? That's very important. Thirdly, whatever forensic information, was the DNA present on the crime scene? Was there uh, ballistics, fingerprints? So your hard and fast forensic evidence. I like to call them ingredients. To me, profiling is like, like baking a cake. Certain basic ingredients you need, otherwise you're not going to have a cake. Um, the more ingredients, the fancier your cake. The body of my brother's son stood by me, knee to knee. The body and I pulled at a rope, but he said no to me. When I interview serial killers, you, you dive into the abyss to, to, to try and get hold of this person um, and to make the real connection, the soul connection. The abyss is, is a very dark place. You don't know where is up, where is down, where is left, where is right. You don't know what's going to happen to you. It feels as if there, there are quite a few predators waiting to jump. Um, it's not silent. You can hear the moans and the screams um, of, of tortured souls. While one profiler traces the killer's footsteps on the killing fields, another seeks a more scientific approach. You do have to try and understand what the person's motive is, what could be driving them. Um, but I wouldn't say that it's a case of immersing yourself into the mind of the killer per se, but rather on a sci more scientific level, and, and more so perhaps you can say even an objective level, trying to figure out what is motivating this person. I think it's very important for a profiler on a crime scene to reconstruct the, the, the process of the crime. Literally, you have to walk in the footsteps of the serial killer. It's, it's very important to get the chronological acts in order, um, to decipher every piece of evidence. For instance, if there was sex, was the sex before or after death? Because that is going to influence your profile. It's a different kind of person that commits necrophilia. And so the soul evolves in its fantasy realm. We found a few instances in South Africa where necrophilia has taken place. Um, suspects go back to the bodies uh, of their victims after the murder, a couple days, weeks, etc., ongoing, and will engage sexually with, with, the, uh, with the bodies of their victims, or masturbate uh, on the presence of the crime scene, even after the body has been removed by the police. Some killers have an urge for necrophilia because a dead body can't reject you. Um, these would usually be men who has a, a deep settled fear of intimacy and of verbal and physical rejection from a woman. Um, and when she's dead, she can't reject you. We study these battered souls like ancient scrolls, hoping to find solutions, rehabilitation, hoping to find absolution. My personal opinion and a lot of my colleagues working with us overseas is that they cannot be rehabilitated. One of the reasons is we don't fully understand what causes it. And if you don't understand what causes it, how do you go about trying to develop a program, do research about it, that will show you that this would be effective in rehabilitating our, our offenders? And a lot of the ones that I've interviewed have said they wouldn't have stopped. They don't know how to stop once they start. 
worldwide, I think there was about 350 serial killers that were released and all of them killed again. They also admit that they will kill again when they get out. I would not want to give a serial killer a second chance on life outside and thereby um, taking away somebody else's only chance of living. Of the 21 cases investigated by myself, Simons was only convicted on the one charge. He was sentenced on the murder charge to 25 years imprisonment and he appealed against the conviction and the sentence. The appeal court then changed the sentence and sentenced him to life imprisonment. I visited Norman Simons um, the following morning after his conviction in prison. Um, he was quite upset. He had to adjust to his new circumstances. Um, at first he didn't want to speak to me. Then he turned around, he came back and enveloped me into his arms and, and gave me a big bear hug. Um, uh, it, it was shocking, both of us cried. I think in that position where I was with, with, with these strong arms around me, th there was an echo of, of his pain, there was an echo of, of the children who died in those arms, screaming. Um, it, it was like a moment out of time. He had several identity crises as well. First of all, I think ethnic. He, he had a coloured mother and a Kosa father. As a child, he grew up in a Kosa community. Also religion. He uh, variated between being a Christian and being a Muslim. And then regarding his sexuality as well. He, I think he was, in a sense, asexual, um, homosexual, but I don't think he practised homosexuality to that extent. At times, this community professed to be haunted by a vampire an elusive demon which vanished after every murder. Now, such ideas are once again cast away with the trash. Still, the train runs along the Cape Flats track. Still, the train brings anxious memories to relatives, profilers and policemen that endured the strangler's beat. I still suffer from flashbacks. I was hospitalized on many occasions and had shock therapy that still affects me. During my admission at the psychiatric institutions, I was on medication that caused forgetfulness. My son Kurt was fitting the age description of the victims. And as a father, I was quite concerned. I was traumatized. I am still traumatized. And I will always be traumatized and affected by these senseless killings. Alone, alone, all, all alone. Alone on a wide, wide sea, and never a saint took pity on my soul in agony. When I exit the abyss, there's a sense of peace. There's no fear. I'm very glad that it's over. Unfortunately, the experience doesn't last very long because the next serial killer would obviously by then be operative. In a very short period of time, five bodies was recovered. What was unique about this case is that all the bodies was lying face down, covered with branches from the surrounding trees, and the shoes was packed neatly next to the bodies. And also what was very unique about this case is that it was three young male, and two women who were killed. But what we found through our experience and research in South Africa is that our serial murders are very different in terms of modus operandi and victimology. We have numerous cases where serial murders uh, murdered male and females as part of their series. Murdered very young people, such as the Norwood serial murderer, he murdered, his youngest victim was 16 years old, and the oldest victim was about 74 years old. We've had um, Moses Satole who murdered females, but he also murdered the infant of one of his victims. Um, we've had others that have murdered young children, uh, males and female, and then also male and female adults. 
uh, and mixed, mixing of our races. If you look at about the 55 cases we've identified since 1990, 14 of them uh, murdered victims of different races. During the time that I was the commander of the investigative psychology unit up to 2000, um, I think South Africa was second in the number of serial killers to the United States who was first. So we do have a high number. Uh, I believe partly um, if you look at places like like Russia also had an increase in their numbers around the time of when they, the fall of the Berlin Wall, when communism fell, a lot of social change. And if we look at our statistics around 1994, we had a, a marked increase in the number of identified serial murders, but we were also going through a period of social change. I closed my lids and kept them closed, and the balls like pulses beat. For the sky and the sea and the sea and the sky lay like a load on my weary eye, and the dead were at my feet. <laughs> capital Park Hill overlooks the capital, Pretoria. A high school is situated at its southern base, while the fresh produce market is situated to the west. From here, the killer lured many victims across the hill, where the journey turned into a nightmare of rape and strangulation. His killing field stretched from the clubhouse to a water tower a mere 500 meters away. The detectives have to collect the physical evidence. The profiler has to interpret the psychological evidence. Sometimes the psychological evidence is tangible, but sometimes it's a feeling, an energy vibration. I was once on a crime scene in Johannesburg where I tried to interpret this energy vibration, and I was fiddling around in the grass when I found a condom that the detectives had not found. A crime scene speaks to you. You have to listen to its story. This scene will tell a grisly tale of six corpses, three males, two females, and a boy. Festering corpses were piled on top of each other, covered with vegetation. Where police had removed three cadavers only two days before, a new body was dumped. We searched this mountain and about 500 meters east from the crime scene, we found a water tower in which we found traces that somebody was sleeping there. We found the security jacket. Inside the jacket was written the name Sam with a force number. There was 14 crosses marked inside this jacket. We traced this jacket to a security company where we find out that this force number was issued to Samuel Sedino. The fact that these murders were committed in such rapid succession and the fact that he left the bodies on exactly the same spot alerted me to the possibility that he was very possessive about his crime scene. Most serial killers are. Serial killers also return to the crime scene to masturbate and to relive the fantasy. And that's why I knew he would be back very soon. The fantasy, the conscious fantasy, in other words, that's the one the person can tell you about or with others what we might refer to the unconscious fantasy is that the driving force that they can't really verbalize um, would play a factor. Uh, for other ones that I, if I think of the ones that I've spoken to, they've said, you know, they were previously arrested for a rape and thereafter they decided that now they're going to rape and murder. In other words, almost like an anger built up towards females or as a result of or a, a particular female or females in general. For others, they might feel that um, Certain types of people, such as prostitutes, are evil and, and it's their responsibility to remove them from the face of the earth. The serial killer is in total control in his fantasy. We all are in total control in our fantasy lives. Then something happens in real life to make him somehow feel inferior. Then he acts out the fantasy to restore the balance, to make him feel god -looking. But unfortunately, reality is never as perfect as fantasy. So he keeps on repeating this acting out of the fantasy in order to get it right. He is omnipotent and in absolute command in his own fantasies. But when his fragile ego or self-esteem is being threatened by any form of rejection or pain, his original childhood agony is triggered and he suffers the irresistible urge to act out his overwhelming fantasy, which is the only way he perceives to resolve the emotional imbalance. The fantasy is the blueprint for the actual acting out of the murder. Okay, fantasy can evolve, but the core fantasy would stay the same. 
There is a difference between the modus operandi and the signature of a serial killer. The MO accounts for the type of crime, victim type, props used, etc. This MO may change, but the killer expresses himself mentally, leaving a unique psychological signature on every scene. This imprint can evolve as he performs post-death mutilation. If you understand the signature, you can stop him. It's very important, I think, for, for a profiler. Um, as a matter of fact, it's crucial for a profiler to decipher the fantasy of the serial killer because it is unique to that person. I believe that there's always something driving these people, but I don't always think they themselves know what it is per se. One or two of them have said, yes, my partner had this fantasy to do this and to do this. And you can see on the crime scenes that they actually did try to do some of those behaviors. But as for this sort of um, Hollywood image of this well thought out constructed fantasy, we haven't really found that often in South Africa. Some serial killers would, would be more violent towards the victims if the victim does not act out her script, you know, that, it, that is scripted in the fantasy for her. Now and again, there have been cases of, of a serial killer that actually set a victim free because she just didn't fit. To track the killer would require a sixth sense. I wouldn't call myself psychic. I would rather call it cryptothesia. Cryptothesia operates on the same principles as quantum physics. Everything consists of molecules that vibrate at a certain energy level. Any person has the ability to pick up these vibrations. If anyone should visit friends of theirs, and the friends just had a fight, you would pick it up. I had the same ability than most people. I think mine was just a little bit more developed. This opens up the mind of the profiler and the killer steps in. The serial killers vary at the rate in which they enter my mind. Sometimes it happens immediately on the crime scene, sometimes it takes a long time. In the Phoenix case, where the serial killer murdered the women in the sugarcane fields, I felt it immediately and I could actually write and recant what had happened in the very first person. Sometimes the wind alerts me to the serial killer and sometimes I would be sitting at home on a Sunday afternoon and also be very aware of a serial killer killing. Very few serial killers ever display remorse or a conscience. Um, we get ego dystonic and ego syntonic serial killers. Moses Itoli, for instance, is an ego is an ego syntonic serial killer. He has no qualms about what he did. He would brag about it. He feels proud about himself and he talks about it. Norman Simons, on the other hand, was an ego dystonic serial killer. His, his ego, his functioning personality, um, cannot accept the fact that he, as a teacher, um, actually killed the young boys. So he would distanciate himself from what he had done and find some kind of excuse um, for what he had done. I can't really say that they've ever expressed great remorse for what they did. Uh, they might say they're sorry and it was wrong and they shouldn't have done it. But a remorse in the sense of breaking down, crying, feeling guilty, uh, I've never, can't really say that I've ever really picked that up in the people that I've interviewed. Generally, serial killers don't experience any remorse. However, in the case of the station strangler, we found signs of undoing, which will indicate remorse. The station strangler redressed his victims after he'd killed and sodomized them, which indicated that he felt sorry for them. We had a team talk and came to the conclusion that the suspect may return the same night to the mountain. We decided to keep observation and requested the task force to do that. The special task force of the police was deployed on the hill. When a new dawn breaks, someone would be in for a surprise. Eventually, you get so immersed in the abyss that you cannot distinguish between your own fantasies and those of the serial killers. I remember once being on a crime scene where the brother had killed his sister and sexually molested her. And I could actually feel the lust that he must have experienced when he murdered her. To me, it was a very frightening experience to feel this lust looking at the body of that young woman. You do often spend a lot of time thinking about these, but I can't say that myself and my colleagues really feel stuck in, in what we do. Uh, maybe it'll happen one day uh, with a particular case. Without a doubt, that's possible. But again, we always try to keep a sort of a, 
uh, objective distance. I think one of the major symptoms of post-traumatic stress is nightmares. Um, I did get many nightmares just about every night. I can recall once when I was interviewing the saloon killer, um, he started telling us about a nightmare and I stopped him, I took the detective outside, told him the rest of the nightmare, went back in and um, Velapi told us the rest of the nightmare as I had it. So I think they were, they were um, a diffusion of boundaries. When we found the body of the young woman on Capitol Hill, the body was left behind on the exact same spot where previous bodies were left behind. As a matter of fact, this body was, was quite fresh. She was about a day or two old and she was covered in maggots. Now these maggots were left behind on the crime scene by the previous bodies. So I know people are creatures of habit. You know, this is, this is his spot where he feels safe, where he wants to leave the bodies. The fresh produce market from where the killer lured his victims was clearly visible from the task force's vantage point. In the early hours of the morning, 35-year-old Samuel Sedino was apprehended on the hill as he returned home from the market. All the evidence found on the scenes and the tower incriminated Sedino. When I spoke to Samuel Sedino, that was during his 30-day observation uh, before I joined the police. I was part of the team observing him for his uh, fitness to stand trial. Um, at that point, despite the evidence, he was in denial. He uh, was denying that he was guilty of the particular crime, so that was his standpoint. Um, and obviously, he, as a result, he wasn't going to say, well, he was abused as a child, because that would indicate some reason or excuse for what he did. And as I said, he was denying at that point that he'd actually committed the murders. Not all serial killers were abused as children, but all of them were neglected as children. I think typical signs would perhaps be a very lonely boy, a very quiet boy, there might be elements of bedwetting, cruelty to animals, and arson. Sedino killed and left the bodies of six victims within a few meters of his home, the Water Tower. In a later confession, he pointed out his crime scenes, including a cadaver on a hill to the north of Capitol Hill. He gave his victims fictitious names and called the process of having sex with a victim making them pretty. Seven bodies were recovered, but there were 14 crosses marked inside Sedino's jacket. I didn't have time to draw up a profile on the Capitol Hill um, serial killer. We arrived at the crime scene and he was arrested a day what, after. Um, from his crime scenes, I would say that he was more disorganized um, than organized. His crime scenes were very messy. Sedino dumped a new body in the exact place where police had retrieved three decomposing corpses two days previously. He was neither stupid, nor did he try to provoke the detectives deliberately. He was merely a creature of habit, like most of us. This principle of habit is a fundamental aspect of criminal profiling, while violent crime seems to be a male tendency. In general, violent crime is, is more likely to be committed by males. Uh, that's quite a, quite a known fact in, in, in crime statistics. Um, Again, there, there are various suggestions. One could be that females tend to rather internalize uh, aggression towards themselves or take it upon themselves, whereas males might be more likely to act out their aggression upon other people. Men respond differently to sex than women. For instance, if a girl was abused, sexually abused when she was a child, she would take it out on herself. She would mutilate herself or she would become promiscuous, but she would sort of punish herself. Men would punish other people, they'll take it out on other people. Women can, can um, equivalent sex with love. Men can have a distance between sex and love, differentiate between the two. Women would reach their sexual peak at about 35 when they're married and they, they have children and they settle. Men would reach it at about 90. That's just about the age when serial killers start acting out. With the, with the male serial killers, their motivation is, is more the sex and the aggression which if you look at Maslow's hierarchy is your basic needs, your physiological basic needs. Now your next basic need is security and that's where the female serial killers fit in. Female serial killers can kill for money, okay? but the money represents and substitutes security. Money or wealth to a man means status. Money or wealth to a woman means security. The serial killer has powerful primitive urges. At about the age of six, the conscience develops as a result of identification with the father figure 
and the incorporation of society's norms and values. If he never bonds with the mother or primary caretaker, he never differentiates his own personality and develops a weak ego. And if he has no positive father figure as role model during the latency phase, he does not manage the socialization process. Thus, his sick fantasies cause no anxiety to his self-esteem. Samuel Sedinu was found guilty and he got seven life sentences, which means that he must sit 40 years effectively in prison. Serial killers are not born, they develop. I think if people take better care of their children, the spate of serial killers could have been prevented. They live on the periphery of society. They are very lonely children. Already by the age of eight, a serial killer could have a fantasy. He just has nobody to talk to. People have a misconception to think that all serial killers are severely abused. They're not. Some of them are severely sexually and physically and emotionally abused. But all serial killers are neglected. They are neglected children. They are on the peripheries of their peer groups. They always feel outsided. They dream a lot. They daydream a lot. We don't have a consistent upbringing that we can say we find in all of our serial murders. Um, you have a lot of people who are physically, sexually abused as children who grow up under terrible circumstances, yet never ever go on to commit any crime of their own. I think one of them said, you know, by the age of 8 or 13 or whatever, he had all these sexual and aggressive fantasies. He didn't have anybody to tell. I think we might tell it, pick it up in their, in their play, you know, that they might be aggressive. Um, you might pick it up in their art. I think somebody sensitive to that might start identifying these children and talking to them. I think after the age of 13, it's too late. The only thing which we should all be doing anyway is, is trying to bring our children up in a very responsible way with enough discipline and care and love. But again, you've had ones that have grown up in that environment yet have still become serial murderers. Serial killers are able to control themselves to the extent that they can decide when to strike and when not to. They kill because they suffer, and by killing, they cause immense suffering to other souls. I never ever got scared of the serial killers. Um, as I say, there's, there's a misconception that they, that they are these um, fear-inspiring, terrible in individuals. They're not. They're very ordinary people. They look very ordinary people. Not all of them are even physically big people. Some of them are wimps. Um, so they don't inspire fear. Um, I always had you know, a lot of armed detectives around me as well, which made me feel very protective. Um, also, I didn't fall within the victim category. With regards to fear, um, because of the work that we do, um, as I said, I don't, I don't have any particular fear that I'm going to be a target of a serial murder that's coming to hunt me down. I think that's more of a Hollywood kind of thing. And I think my two colleagues who are females and have been in the unit for numerous years, I think they also share the same feeling that they don't particularly feel that they are at risk of a serial murderer trying to track them down because of, because of what they do. When I arrived on the mountain that morning, I didn't realize that this would be my very last crime scene in the South African police service. During the day, a police chopper came to the scene and let down a police dock, but this chopper hovered right above the crime scene. The wind of the chopper blew all these maggots into my hair and into my clothing. And at that moment I realized, this is the end. I've had enough. I can recognize that there was a lot of damage um, to me, um, which I take responsibility for. I'm the one, you know, who did the job. Um, I didn't take precautions of, of defending myself against the psychological onslaughts in the beginning. Um, I never took a break. I just kept on doing it, which I don't think was a good thing. I didn't really trust people to talk to them. It was only near the end you know, that, I, that I seeked therapy for what I was going to. I, I have been in the South African police service for 20 years, so I'm used to it. Murders of children still upset me, but I don't discuss my work with my family. I think this job, without a doubt, does affect your life in various ways. Um, as I said, you're on 24-hour standby, so you can get a phone call any time of the day or night to come out to a crime scene or be told to go down to Durban or Cape Town, and you can be away for a few days or a week or two. So that, that has an impact. Um, I think it, if I speak from my own experience, and I think it's quite similar for my colleagues, it's not something that you can really talk about over dinner or dinner parties. Um, you get a lot of people who are very interested and, and want to ask, but 
we don't really like to satisfy people's morbid curiosity. So you almost avoid talking about what you do for that reason, uh, which means often what you're left with to talk about. Um, I would have done it slightly differently in the sense that I would have opened up a little bit more to my family and to my friends, um, but I thought I was protecting them by not telling them what I went through. I, I've never had bad dreams about what I do. I don't, uh, I believe I can switch off when I do go home to a degree and focus on other things and focus on more positive things. Um, but again, you know, in, in 10 years' time, it, it might be a different thing. Uh, by then, too much might have piled up uh, on one's shoulders to cope with. So all I can say is at this point so far, um, I haven't picked up any problems, touch wood. The journey that I followed changed my life. It, it was a very, very dark road. Um, getting out of it now, I like to live in the light. I like to have fun. It's, it's completely different. I've changed my life. Serial murder is the ultimate in selfishness in its purest and most refined form. The serial killer's lives are directed exclusively towards self-indulgence and contrary to popular belief, they never try to get caught. The mariner whose eye is bright, whose beard with age is hoar, is gone. And now the wedding guest turned from the bridegroom's door. He went like one that hath been stunned and is of sense forlorn. A sadder and a wiser man, he rose the morrow morn.